When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, so when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, so when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh, God. Battle belongs to you. Almighty fortress. And almighty fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Good morning, Encounter. Have a seat. Have a seat. We're glad you're here this morning. Kind of a low-key uh, start. We've got, uh, how many of y'all remember back uh, when they had uh, uh, MTV Unplugged? Y'all remember, some of y'all remember some of that? Okay, yeah, so we're doing a little bit of an unplugged uh, day today. We're glad to have uh, David leading us this morning. Let me share with you some announcements so you know what's going on in the church. And while I do that, if you would, give us a registration of your attendance. You'll see uh, registration pads on each row and a basket for the offering as well. Pass that down so everybody gets a chance to, uh, to take care of the offering this morning. And uh, if you're on the end of a row, uh, would you tear out the page that everybody signed up on or registered with and put that in the basket? That'll make it easier on our folks when uh, they come around to collect the uh, the uh, registration and all that stuff right after the service. Okay, let me share some things going on. Next Sunday, this is not in the bulletin, but I want to highlight it. Next Sunday, if you're on the Board of Stewards, we will be having a Board of Stewards meeting right after church next Sunday. So please be aware of that. 
this Wednesday, Potluck with a Purpose. Uh, it's at 5.30 p.m. We please bring a dish to share and a snack lunch appropriate item to be donated to the Mission House. So if there's a snack lunch kind of item that you can bring, uh, that you, we'll donate those to the, uh, to the Mission House. And, uh, but, the, but, the, but the pot with the food in it, that's the stuff we'll eat, okay? So uh, save that for the table. Don't get them mixed up on which goes where, okay? All right, that's always fun. We have a great crew of folks that come for that. It's also a great way to get to know some, uh, some of our folks in our church. Uh, folks from the second service and first service are together. We get to see one another and get to know one another. It's a great thing. Uh, our prayer quilt ministry is going to be uh, having a work session this Thursday, September 12th, in the Family Life Center from 9 a.m. till 12 p.m. And all are welcome. Uh, and uh, they pray over their quilts because uh, these are prayer quilts that are handed out to persons in need. Uh, and we have given out, I, I can't remember the total number, I, it's, it's, an, it's an enormous amount. What's, does anybody know the number that we've given out, Leah, do y'all know? Like 50, 90? Oh, wow, I was thinking like 50 or 60, 90 or so that have been given. You could be wrong. Hey, that's still a lot. Let's just let, that's so, something worth giving glory to God for. That's awesome. And I tell you, I hear from the folks that receive these, and they are very touched, very blessed, knowing that their church not only has something practical that they are given as a reminder of their, that they are loved, but also that they know that they've been, they've been prayed for because these, these quilts have been prayed over. All right, children's ministry dates coming up. Planning meeting this Thursday, September 12th, 6 p.m. That's going to be over in Harper Hall. Please, please bring your calendars and, and make plans for the next few months for the children's ministry events. And then in September, we've got Club M&M. This is next Sunday. Uh, Club M&M is for four-year-olds through third graders. They're going to meet in Harper Hall at 4 o'clock, and it'll go till 5.30. And uh, Club 118, which is for our fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, that's going to be uh, the following Sunday, se September 22nd. It'll be at the Wood Home from 4 to, uh, to 5.30. Uh, let's see, one other thing. Is, is Ruth here? Ruth, you want to come tell them about the Southern Gospel singing? Uh, we've got a, a neat event coming up here, and I'm going to let Miss uh, Miss Ruth tell us all about it. So come on down here, Ruth. If y'all don't know Miss Ruth, she's a wonderful neighbor. I'll tell you that. <laughs> we live in the same neighborhood. Here you go. It's unfortunate for me, isn't it? Um, how many of you liked home-baked cookies? Everybody? Well, okay, that's an enticement. Um, so on September the 22nd, at 6 o'clock in the sanctuary, we're going to have a southern gospel singing, which includes bluegrass, country singing, all kinds of things, and make us all happy, okay? It's going to be a joyous occasion. We want you to come. If you want to sing... You need to let me know by next Sunday if you want to have a group sing, if you want your children to sing, if you want your family to sing, or if some of you can't sing, you can make a joyful noise. And, yeah, I can hear some of you have a joyful noise now. Um, so if, if you would like to be there, we want you to come. We want you to sing with us. The congregation will be asked to sing a couple of songs. Now back to the cookies. So I enticed you to begin with. There is a Sunday school class here that calls themselves Spare Parts. I will not go into why they call them that. But they, they have volunteered to bake cookies for afterwards. And the only way you're going to get a cookie is if you come to the singing. So we look forward to seeing you. Thank you and God bless. Right. Give Miss Ruth a hand there. Are there any other announcements? Anything else that needs to be shared? If not, then let's stand and greet one another in the name of the Lord.
that is who you are oh you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are oh you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you Oh, you are a maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, oh, that is who you
is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. You go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. You come back with the head of my enemy. You come back and you call it my victory. Oh. Comes my greatest difference. It leads me from the dry wilderness. And all I did was praise. And all I did was worship. And all I did was bow down. All I did was can seek to find your truth. Your mercy is the shade I'm living in. You restore my faith and hope again. And all I did was pray. And all I did was worship. You. All I did was bow down. God, all I did was stay still. Sing hallelujah. And hallelujah, you have saved me so much better. Better. 
better your ways are higher so this morning we surrender ourselves to you we give you all of our praise all of the honor all of the worship because you're the only one who's worth it Lord please as we continue this morning stay in this place we love you Lord it's in your holy name we pray Please remain standing with me. I don't know about you guys, but I needed this this morning. I needed worship. I needed to re, as I say, reorient my internal compass to the true uh, north of Jesus Christ. And and uh, if you feel the same way, let's give God glory and pray for uh, uh, just today and an opportunity to worship. And thank you, David, for your leadership uh, in that. I'm going to be reading this morning uh, to start off our sermon. It's the second sermon in our series. Uh, 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 called Loving Well, and uh, this is uh, a passage that comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. You will probably recognize it uh, a couple of different ways. One, that's uh, the beginning of it is the Luke's version of Jesus giving the great commandments, and number two, uh, it is the story of the, uh, the Good Samaritan, probably one of the most uh, popular stories that we learn as a child growing up in the church. Luke chapter 10 beginning with verse 25, says this, One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, What does, your, what does the law of Moses say? How, did, how do you read it? And the man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. Now, last week we talked about that strength and mind being interchangeable. Here in Luke's Gospel, the translators went ahead and put both of them down. Uh, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this, and you will live. The man uh, wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, and when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walking over to and looked at him and lying there, and he, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan smoothed, soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where they, where they took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man in his bill. Uh, if his bill runs any higher than this, I'll pay it the next time I'm here. Now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. And the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word. Speak it to our hearts. 
let me share it directly from Scripture and nothing of myself. So that it is your word that goes out and is proclaimed because that is what has the power to transform hearts and lives. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Uh, did you hear the one about the, uh, the fellow who, who called into 911? His wife was at home and she had just gone into labor right there and then in the home and he was, didn't know what to do. He panicked. It was too, too late to get her driver to the hospital. And so he called 911 and said, my wife is in labor. And the 911 operator asked, is this her first child? And the man said, no, I'm her husband. <laughs> some of y'all got that. It'll come to some of you later, okay? Just think about it, all right? Okay. All right, so we are continuing this morning uh, in our sermon series on loving well. And today we're talking about loving your neighbor. Loving your neighbor. Last week we talked about loving God, and today we're talking about loving your neighbor. Loving our neighbor is, when, is what Jesus called the second greatest commandment. Listen again to, to Matthew uh, 22. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as what? Yourself. All of the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Now today, we're talking about loving our neighbors. Next week, we're going to talk about that other part. It says, you know, you love your neighbor as you love yourself. So we're going to talk about loving ourselves. We'll do that next week. After that, we're going to talk about loving our enemies. Uh, that's always a tough one. Uh, and then we're going to talk about loving our church. And so uh, that's all going to be in there. Uh, all right. So uh, this is, uh, you know, a parable that Jesus tells. Like I said a minute ago, it's probably one of the most popular parables that, that Jesus tells. That the, Our kids love hearing it. Uh, we love telling it to in Sunday schools. We love doing devotions about it. It is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And it helps us to know a, a little context here about the nature of the road uh, between uh, Jerusalem and Jericho. Uh, this is the road upon which the parable story is conveyed and told about. And, and so uh, we need to understand the context a little bit. kind of gives a little more oomph to the story. Uh, and it's a context that would have been fully understood by Jesus' audience. You see, Jerusalem, or you see, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was notoriously dangerous. It was a kind of a road that you didn't travel alone if you could help it. Jerusalem is 2,300 feet above sea level. The Dead Sea near Jericho stood around 1,300 feet below sea level. So basically, we're looking at a road that dropped approximately uh, 3,600 feet from one end to the other. And because of this, it was a road that was filled with narrow and even rocky passages. It was filled with twists and turns. It was the perfect hunting ground for would-be bandits, thugs, miscreants, uh, uh, hooligans, and any other word you want to make up about people that do bad things, okay? Uh, the road from Jerusalem to Jer Jericho was dangerous. It was not the kind of road you wanted to go down all by yourself. This is actually was still the case as early as, uh, is, is the 19th century. In the 19th century, it was still necessary to pay monies to the local sheiks to travel this road safely. And as late as 1930s, the early 1930s, the traveler writer by the name of H.V. Morton tells us that, that he was warned to get home before dark if he intended to use that road because there were certain roaming bandits who would hold up cars and rob travelers and tourists along this stretch of the road. So it's a historically uh, 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 a dangerous place to be, this stretch of road uh, between Jericho and Jerusalem. One should be able to assume that uh, any common person had enough common sense not to travel this uh, dangerous road by themselves. And maybe, maybe our, 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 our fellow here, that, that this Jewish person, it says, uh, that got hit by the bandits, maybe he didn't start off that way, maybe as far as by himself. Maybe he started off with a group of people, and there were crossroads along the way, and this person wanted to go to this town, and this group went to that town, but for whatever reason, he was by himself on a certain stretch of that road when the bandits attacked him. It could be uh, that he was taken advantage of by people that he met along the road, people who could be considered would-be friends. Maybe they started out with him, 
saw him as an easy target, uh, acted like their friends. Hey, let's travel together for safety. And they made it along the roads. If you've, listened, if you've read any of, of history of Texas, you hear stories like this that have taken place. Stories are told of East Texas from, from when travelers still, uh, were, uh, when Texas was still part of Mexico, travelers would uh, be coming to the United States from Louisiana. Uh, uh, they would travel from Tennessee. They'd travel from southern states. And they would travel into East Texas because they wanted to, to start families and lands and farms in, uh, in, in Tejas, as you will. Uh, and as they moved into Texas, travelers would travel in groups together as they, as, as they would to find safety in numbers. And sometimes what they would find is thieves would be waiting for them in the towns near the borders. And they would get to those towns near the borders and, and they would see that there's, oh, there's a group, they're fixing to head into Texas. And they would become friends with them at the bar or saloon or whatever it may be. Hey, can we travel with you? And they would become their best buddies until they got them out in the middle of nowhere. And then they would rob them blind. Who knows? This may have been the case for the traveler in Jesus' parable. All we know from this story is that Jesus says there was a traveler who was on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho coming down all of its winding paths and around its natural bends. And at some point, at some time, in some way, he was robbed, he was, uh, he was beaten, and he was left for dead. Yet, he apparently wasn't the only one traveling by themselves on this road. Jesus tells of two other people that were traveling along this road, two religious people. Uh, the story goes on to tell us that uh, two other people saw him lying in the ditch there, beaten up and bloodied. Uh, first was a, a Jewish priest. It uh, says in other, other uh, translations, it was a Jewish priest who came by. He sees him on the side of the road. He's walking down the road, you know. There he is. Uh-oh. He doesn't just, uh, you know, go around. He, he goes all the way to the other side of the road, then goes around him. He completely avoided even getting near him. Now, no doubt the Jewish priest was remembering the Old Testament commandments, the Numbers chapter 19, verse 11, where it talks about, you know, it's un, uh, unrighteous or ungood. It's not good for a man, to, a Jewish man, to touch a, a dead body. Maybe he assumed he was dead. Uh, maybe, maybe not. I mean, uh, th th there's no mercy shown, but that's the point Jesus is trying to make. He refused to risk uh, getting his hands dirty. He refused to risk uh, uh, finding out more about this situation uh, that, that uh, he could have provided help for. He refused to, to take a risk, and, and uh, he refused to, to, uh, to do his duty of charity. Uh, the second man that comes by is a, is a Levite, okay? A Levite is a lesser uh, temple worker, a low-ranking priest, if you will. Uh, and and maybe, maybe he thought the man was a decoy. You know, this was something they did on the road. They would pretend like somebody was beaten up and dead, and, and then you go over to help them, and while you're busy trying to help them, bandits would come out from behind you, Maybe that's what he thought. Maybe, maybe it was. Maybe it, maybe it wasn't. It could have been that these uh, two men thought the very same thing as they passed them by. Or it could have simply been that they saw a man, they saw someone who was in need, someone who would take up their time, someone who would uh, 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 keep them from getting uh, to the place they wanted to be on a timely fashion, Someone who would get their, make them get their hands dirty, would make them get involved. Uh, someone that would, would uh, make them to, to use of their resources uh, 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 to help him. And, and they didn't want to be bothered uh, by that trouble. Because when they looked at that person, they didn't see a flesh and blood human being. They didn't see someone who was just like them. Instead, they saw someone who was a bother. And they saw someone who... Uh, was an inconvenience. They saw someone who they didn't want anything to deal with. But then comes the third person. And Jesus is very clear. This is a Jewish man. And the third person that comes down the road is a Samaritan. Okay? He's very clear about that, and it's a very important part of the, the story. You see, when Jesus begins to introduce the Samaritan in this parable, his Jewish audience, to whom he was speaking... Uh, would have very likely said, aha, here comes, here comes the, uh, the, the bad guy in the story. 
In fact, in their heart of hearts, they were probably booing him. Jews and Samaritans didn't get along. They didn't like each other. Uh, they thought uh, ill of each other. They uh, talked badly about each other. They, they didn't want anything to, to do with each other. And, and yet, Jesus is introducing him not as the antagonist of the story, not as the, 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 the evil person of the story. Rather, Jesus introduces him as the hero of the story. He ends up being the hero and not the villain. And sure enough, this raised, I'm sure, a few eyebrows in Jesus telling the story. And then to hear Jesus tell the rest of it, to tell that this, this Samaritan had compassion on this person. The Samaritan didn't cross to the other side of the road, but rather got his hands dirty. The Samaritan took of his own time, his own uh, resources, his own olive oil, his own wine, his own bandages. He gave of himself for the sake of someone else so that the other person could be better, so the other person could be healed, so the other person could be uh, cared for. And then he doesn't just do that. He doesn't just bandage him up on the side of the road and say, you're good, have a good one, bye-bye. No, he carries him to an inn. He provides for him shelter. He provides for him a place to sleep and recover. And then he gives the, the innkeeper money to cover his debts of, of what it would cost to stay in the room. And he says, here, if there's anything extra, if there's any more needed of this, I will be back at some point and you just put it on my bill and I will make sure that it is taken care of. It's an amazing story of kindness, of, of compassion, of care, of a man showing another man practical expression of a godly kind of love. Have you ever been blessed by a Samaritan? I mean, think back to your own life. Have you, has there ever been a time in your life when you've experienced uh, uh, the, the, the blessing of somebody who you may or may not have known. I, I shared a number of years ago on Facebook that question. Have you ever been blessed by a good Samaritan? And I had several people respond. I want to share with you a couple of those. One was a, 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 a woman we knew back when Kimberly and I lived in, in Nacogdoches. It was Episcopal priest's wife, Kate, Kate Whaley. And uh, Kate said that their whole family one time was driving through the pouring rain in Pennsylvania, and they found themselves on a toll road with no cash or coins. We stopped at a toll booth, and we asked if we could write a check or pay with Visa. And the lady said that we need to go through the toll booth, pull over, and go inside the building uh, to pay the, tow we, the toll we owed. We pulled over, and we were looking for an umbrella when there was a knock on the window. It was a guy who pulled into the toll booth behind us. He had paid our toll and gave us money for the next toll down the road. We were stunned that someone who had every right to be annoyed with us for slowing down the toll lane paid our toll, and got out of his car in the pouring rain to give us cash for the next one. We felt very blessed, very loved, very taken care of by one of God's servants. Wade Harmon uh, tells the story of a, it's kind of a twist on the Good Samaritan story. He shared with me how during a tough year back in 2000, he had dropped his wife off at uh, one of her several hospital visits. She has a lot of medical things going on. She, this time it was at a hospital in Palestine. Uh, it was about midnight, and I was, I was between Elkhart and Alto on my way home to Nacogdoches, and I saw a man sitting on the side of the road waving his arms. Now, I don't normally pull over, but he writes, that night I felt compelled by God to stop. And he, his car had died, and he lived about two miles down the road, and so Wade gave him a ride to his home. I told him about my wife, and it turned out that he, too, was a pastor. And when we got to his house, he prayed for me and Cynthia. And I will never forget this stop and how I could see God's helping hand on my trip home. I don't know who the Samar I don't know who this who was the Samaritan, me or the pastor. Teresa Christian is a friend of ours from our very first church out in West Texas in a little town called Fritch. And Teresa wrote uh, in response to my question. She said we were having an especially hard year that year. Many of our kids were, uh, uh, or most of our our kids. We're all at home, about six of them. Uh, money was tight, and the, the back glass of their minivan had been broken out by a rock. And so they're driving around with plastic taped to their back window for the longest time because they didn't, frankly, didn't have the money to get it fixed. We were just devastated that, at, at, uh, 
at not having enough money, and the deductible for the insurance was about $500, not money that they had. But our faith was strong, and we trusted that God would have a plan. Until the plan came through, we drove it with plastic taped over the missing window. Then one faithful day, David, her husband, happened to be driving the minivan to work that day. He normally drove his own truck, but for whatever reason, that particular day, he drove the minivan. On his way home, a gentleman pulled David over and told him that he had a wrecked minivan just like ours in his backyard and that he would be glad to give us the back window out of that old beat-up minivan. David was so touched by what, he had just, what had just happened that he told the man right then and right there that he knew he had been sent by God. I remember David rushed in that day to tell me the good news and, and all we could do was cry because we knew that we had been touched by the hand of God that day. What are the chances, Teresa wrote, of David being the, on the road the same time on the same day as that man, having driven not his pickup truck that he drove every single day, but the minivan uh, that was hers? And what are the chances that the man would have had the same exact minivan and the same exact window that they needed that he had no more need for? God is good all the time. To this day, neither of us can tell this story without crying. And listen to this. I love the way she ends her story. She says, uh, a good Samaritan is just a willing person doing what the good Lord lays on his heart. Isn't that great? Read that with me. A good Samaritan is just a willing person doing what the good Lord lays on his heart. You know, as we walk down this road of life, seeking to be people who love well, We do that not only by loving God, but by being sure that we're loving our neighbors. Travelers down the road of life that need our help uh, along the way. We may already know them. We may not know them from Adam. Nonetheless, God asks us to show love in practical ways by taking practical steps that might involve us uh, uh, not crossing the road to avoid something, but rather getting our hands dirty giving of our resources, giving of our time, energy, and efforts to be a blessing to someone else. If the Lord lays it on our hearts to help another traveler along this road, uh, we best comply uh, to the Lord's direction. Now, I want to give one caveat, especially in terms of the driving around and picking somebody up kind of a thing. God has given you a brain and use it, you know, okay? Uh, uh, he wants you to be smart about things. A woman driving down the road alone at night doesn't need to pick up a hitchhiker or anything like that. Uh, we do live in a dangerous world. My dad always said, David, there's a lot of crazy people in this world. And, that, and that's absolutely true. So use good common sense uh, when, when things like this come around. But having said that, we too need not let an opportunity to do good for someone else pass us by. Okay? There's a lot more scenarios out there to loving others well that doesn't involve picking up a stranger on the side of the road. The Samaritan didn't let the barriers of race, he didn't let the barriers of religion get in his way, he didn't let the barriers of what the culture had said or what society had said about who you should be nice to or who you should love and not love and all that he, and neither should we. It's easy to write someone off because they are of a different race or they're a different skin color or they're a different culture than our, our own. God doesn't want such foolish barriers to keep us from an opportunity to be his hands and feet. And it certainly wasn't an issue for the Good Samaritan, and it shouldn't be an issue for us. Now, this, this idea, this concept of loving our neighbor is not just something that Jesus spoke of at, at one little slither of the gospel. In fact, we read this idea, this, this commandment to love our neighbors throughout the entirety of of the Bible. In the Old Testament, Leviticus, we read these words, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself, for I am the Lord. And then in Galatians, Paul writes, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And then James also affirms this commands, if you really keep the royal law of Uh, found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. Are you getting the picture? Is this sinking in? We're we're not just encouraged to love our neighbor. We're not just encouraged to help somebody in need. 
We're not just, uh, uh, it's not just a mere suggestion by God. This is a command from Jesus himself and a command from God's holy scriptures that we are to love our neighbors. And God gives us opportunities to do this, to do good, to love people every single day. And if we're walking in the Spirit, if our prayer life is prayed up and we're listening for the Holy Spirit's leading in our lives, then there are going to be times when God's still small voice will speak to us and say, here's a situation I put right in front of you. I need you to do something about it. Here's somebody who needs a, a, a help, and, and I put them on your path, and I want you to be my hands and feet and ears and, and eyes and, and, and compassion right here and mercy right here in this moment. You see, there are many travelers on the road of life who need a little help along the way. Along the way. They need love expressed to them in practical ways. A neighbor is anyone who shows practical love to others. And anyone can be our neighbor. Showing others practical love means treating them with kindness, compassion, and respect, seeking their well-being, and showing care and empathy just as we would want to be treated. Leave that up there just for a second. Sometimes we think that this idea of love is about mushy-gushy feelings, okay? We kind of talked about this a little bit last week when it comes to, to loving God. We love God because we feel like we love God. Loving people is more than just about feelings you have for them. Love is, a, is an action verb. Showing others practical things, practical means of kindness and compassion and respect. Self or seeking their well-being and showing others care and empathy just as we would want to be treated. It's about putting others' needs before our own and reflecting God's love in our actions. In Jesus' parable, it involved caring for a traveler on the side of a road. But it, can be, it, could, it could show itself in many and various other ways. It could be lending a hand with yard work or groceries or other needs. It can be inviting someone over for dinner and, and making them a homemade meal or bringing them food when, when their family's in the midst of crisis. It can be uh, being present and attentive uh, to another person who's going through a rough time. It can be writing a card or a message that lifts up someone's spirit. It can be praying for someone and praying with someone. It can be remembering someone's birthday or anniversary with a small gesture. It can be extending a warm invitation to come to, to worship or, or to church. A, a quick visit to show that someone that you care or interested in their well-being. A text to check in on somebody. How are you doing? I haven't seen you in a while. What's going on? Even small interactions with others where we practice kindness and patience are all ways that we can show our neighbor's love in practical, uh, in practical ways. Loving our neighbor also includes bearing one another's burdens. It also includes being patient with someone. It also includes showing someone grace or believing the best in another person or giving someone a second chance or forgiving them when they mess up. Are your spiritual eyes opened far enough to see what God may have for you in the days and weeks and months ahead? Will you see the opportunities God puts right smack dab in front of you to show love to others? The opportunities to love people, the opportunities to bless people. I hope your eyes are open and your hearts are receptive. For who knows, the blessing may not only be for that person, but it may be, as Wade Harmon said, the blessing may also be for you when you do what you know is right and good to do. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all said together, amen. I'm going to invite David to come on back up. He's going to lead us in our closing song this morning. If if you're here this morning, God is moving your heart and life, and you're ready to uh, publicly profess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to come forward and let us uh, receive you today and celebrate with you today. If you have already done that and you're now ready to, uh, to take a step of faith by becoming a member of Bullard Methodist Church, getting plugged into its mission and its ministries, then I invite you to, uh, to see me after the service today or give me a call this week. We can set up a time uh, to, talk about, uh, to talk about membership. And uh, if you simply need this altar, these altar uh, kneelers are here and ready to receive you. Uh, maybe there's someone that uh, you need to uh, 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 lay at the Lord's feet, pray for, 
Maybe it's about praying for yourself. Maybe this has not been something you've been doing very well lately and, and you need to ask God's help to help me love my neighbor better. Uh, you're invited to either come back forward or you can pray where you are. But let us stand together as we sing our closing song. Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless The Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord of this sermon series is to help us learn to love well, love better. We do that by moving out from ourselves, seeking to, to be that conduit that God wants us to be, where we receive His love, but not hoard it. <laughs> Instead, we're a conduit. It, it flows into us and it flows out of us into the lives of others. So go and pour out the love of God in practical ways so that others may come to know the saving love of Jesus Christ that makes a difference in your life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all said together, amen. Go in peace. <laughs>